It's certainly good to be here this morning. I appreciate very much the elders and those preachers and those who are responsible for this lectureship and for my being here and having the opportunity of speaking to you this morning. I know nine o'clock is a hard time for people to get up and get out, have to get up before breakfast. <laughs> But anyway, those of you who are here this morning, I want you to know that we appreciate your presence, and I know you're here because you want to be here, especially since it's as early as it is. I want to, and I hope incidentally that the church here will continue in this great work, because this is a great work. It was my privilege several years ago, that's when I was working with the church at Hanley, to, on a part-time basis, to teach in this preacher's training school and some who were in that class at that time are here uh, this morning. And we appreciate, of course, seeing all of you, and uh, we appreciate the fact that we're able to be with you today. The Lord's Supper, as is mentioned, is something that it seems to me that we take for granted too many times in the Lord's Church, and it's used, uh, it's observed, it seems to me, rather lightly with some, and it seems, too, that some brethren are getting to the point that they sort of just kick the Lord's Supper around and let it bounce around sort of like a football on a football field when it hits the ground. You don't know which way it's going. And, uh, but the Lord's Supper is really uh, this uh, worst part of the worship service uh, in the first century church that they took very seriously. In fact, it's the center of all of our worship, really, when we get right down to it. Going back in the New Testament, the book of Acts, the second chapter, we notice that the Bible tells us here that when the apostles preached the gospel of Christ, that they that gladly received his word, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, the breaking of bread, and in prayers. Now we notice that these brethren continued steadfastly. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in the apostles' teaching. They continued steadfastly in fellowship. They continued steadfastly in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then we learn as we turn to the 20th chapter of the book of Acts and in the 7th verse of that chapter that the disciples came together upon the first day of the week to break bread. And so this was, an, uh, this was a weekly observance so far as the disciples of the first century is concerned. But I'd like for us to notice uh, some things concerning the institution of the Lord's Supper that I think will help us to appreciate, uh, perhaps even greater, the real significance of the Lord's Supper. First of all, when we go back into the Old Testament, we notice that these people observed the Feast of the Passover. And this was an observance that God gave to them. It was a a law that he gave to them that they were to observe the feast of the Passover, and that was to be done on a regular basis. Not only that, but we also recognize the fact that when Jesus came into the world, and as he was teaching his disciples, that he also observed the feast of the Passover. And it was at this feast of the Passover, as recorded in the book of Mark, the 14th chapter, beginning with about verse 12, also in the book of Luke, the 22nd chapter, Matthew, the 26th chapter, where Jesus Christ was observing the Lord's Supper with his, or rather the Feast of the Passover with his disciples, and at this point he instituted the Lord's Supper. And just as the people of uh, Israel uh, observed, or rather the Feast of the Passover was instituted before their deliverance from Egyptian bondage, Jesus, our Lord, instituted the Lord's Supper before his death, before his burial, and his resurrection. Furthermore, the Israelites were in bondage in a foreign land, in a land that was very oppressive so far as they were concerned. And these people were oppressed, these people were pushed down. This was a tyrant government, as it were, so far as the Israelites were concerned, as you well know. And these people were having an awful hard time in the land of Egypt. And so they began to complain. And not only did they complain, but finally they began to cry out unto the Lord for deliverance, as we learn from the book of Exodus, the third chapter. If you'll read the 12th and 13th chapters of the book of Exodus, you'll read about uh, the, the plagues that they had in the land of Egypt. 
and these plagues that God placed upon uh, Egypt simply because Pharaoh would not listen to Moses and Aaron and permit the children of Israel to leave the land of Egypt. They wanted to leave. But he would not permit that. And finally, when the tenth plague came upon the land of Egypt, it got the attention of Pharaoh and the Israelites, and they decided that they would let them go. You remember, too, as we read about these plagues, that God had made a statement to the Israelites. He said, now you uh, kill a, a lamb, and you take this lamb, the blood of this lamb, and you place it upon the doorposts, both side and upper doorposts of your house. That is, the side doorposts and the lentils. And then uh, at midnight, uh, I will pass over you, and then uh, in the home of every uh, family where this blood is not found on the doorposts of that house, the eldest of that family will die. And so the children of Israel got busy and they did exactly as God had commanded them to do in that they uh, killed the lamb, the eldest person in the family, along with, uh, he killed the lamb. And then, of course, the others began to uh, observe uh, the uh, command or the Passover as God had instructed them to do. They took the blood that was placed in a basin and they took the hyssop and when they took this blood from this bowl or this basin, they put it upon these doorposts and then when they did that, of course, uh, midnight, the death angel came over and then the eldest in each family died. I might read to you the statements made that God said, for I will pass through the land this night land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And uh, this day shall be unto you for a memorial. Exodus 12, chapter verses 12 and 14. Now, this was to be a memorial to the children of Israel of their deliverance out of the land of Egypt. God's people needed the assistance of God. Then as we go on and we read, of course, other things in the New Testament, we find that the feast of the Passover had been observed, as was being observed by Jesus Christ and by his apostles uh, that is instituted before his death as he, they had observed it up until this point, as the law of Moses had directed them. Then we find that it was being done in remembrance of the deliverance of the Israelites out of Egyptian bondage. Now, when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, he took the bread, and he said, this is my body, and he says, you take and you eat of it, and you do it in remembrance of me. Not only that, but he took the cup, the fruit of the vine, and he drank, he gave to them, he drank, and he gave to them. And he said, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you. He said, this you are to take, and you are to take it in remembrance of me. And so this Lord's Supper that was instituted was instituted uh, for the purpose of it being in remembrance of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so when we take the Lord's Supper, we do this in remembrance of Christ. Now, another point I want us to notice Jesus said, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now, mankind has been in sin, and he was in sin at this time. And he needed a deliverer, just as the children of Israel needed a deliverer from Egyptian bondage. And they would not have been delivered from Egyptian bondage had it not been for the institution of the Passover. And had they not observed that just exactly as God had instructed them to do. Now, man has been in sin for all have sinned, the Bible says, and come short of the glory of God. And so since sin has come upon all men, we have need something to deliver us from this sin. I want to turn to you, uh, turn uh, with me, if you will, to the book of Romans, the third chapter. And you notice in verse 23 where he made the statement, he said, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Then again in the fifth chapter, and in verse 8 of that chapter, he says, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So remember under the old law that they took this calf and uh, the lamb when they made the sacrifice, and this animal had to be an animal that was without spot or without blemish. This was a type of 
uh, Christ and of his death, of his burial, and his resurrection. And then again, as we notice, he said that sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through the righteousness unto, unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see that sin has reigned. Now Christ has come. Christ has died, and it is by the grace of God that he gave Christ to us to die for the sins of the world. And so we are to do what the Lord has commanded us to do and ought to be forgiven of those sins. I'd like to also turn to the book of Hebrews, and in the ninth chapter of the book of Hebrews, and notice here, passage or two, that might help us along this line. He says, beginning with verse uh, chapter 9, I believe it is, and beginning with verse 11 of that ch uh, chapter, he says, but Christ being come and high priest uh, of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle and, he says, not made with hands, uh, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves. And he says, this is not by the blood of these goats and calves, but by his own blood. Notice, by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place having obtained eternal redemption for us. Now, from the very beginning of time, we notice that efficacy is in the blood. Life is in blood. And without blood, there is no life. A life uh, we have life from a physical standpoint because of the blood that flows through our physical veins and our physical organs. And without this blood, you and I could not survive. You take this hand, when the finger that I have here, and if it's cut off, then there is no life in that finger anymore because the blood doesn't flow to it. When we're cut off from Jesus Christ, our Lord, uh, there is no spiritual blood flowing through our spiritual veins. Hence, we die and we're lost. We are not redeemed with the blood, but with the silver and gold and things, the precious metals and things of that nature, Peter says. But we are redeemed by the precious blood of Christ, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. And so it is by the blood of Christ. Hebrews, the 10th chapter, beginning with verse 10 of that chapter, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ. We are sanctified. We are set apart by the offering of the body of Christ. So Christ had to offer his body. Now I want us to notice in contrast a few things here as we uh, continue with trying to lay the foundation concerning these matters with the old law and the new law and what significance it has with us so far as the Lord's Supper is concerned. Point number one I want to make is that in the Jewish Passover, a lamb or a kid without spot or blemish was sacrificed. Exodus 12, chapter and verse 5. Jesus Christ, the mediator of the New Testament, is the Lamb of God without spot or blemish who was sacrificed for our redemption. Hebrews 9, verses 11 and 12, 13 and 14. And also in 1 Corinthians 5 and 7, he says, keep the feast, uh, keep the feast, not with old leaven, that is the leaven of malice and wickedness, but uh, we are to keep this feast of unleavened bread with sincerity and truth. Now I want to pause there just to make a point. You know, as we observe the Lord's Supper, sometimes people feel that they can go out and they can have malice and envy and things of this nature in their hearts against other brethren, and they can come on and take the Lord's Supper, and then it's all right. But G, uh, the Apostle Paul tells us that we are to eliminate this unleavened, that is, the unle uh, this leaven of malice and wickedness, and we are to take the unleavened of sincerity and truth. And that's what's to be in our hearts. That's the attitude that we're to have. Then you go on here in the next part, observation number three. The Paschal Lamb was their Passover, Exodus 12, chapter, and verse 21. Jesus Christ is our Passover, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, and 8. So Christ is our Passover that was sacrificed for us. Christ was sacrificed for us. Not a, a lamb, not a calf, or a bull, or a goat, or anything of that kind. That blood could not take away the sins of the world. But Jesus Christ, our Lord, the sacrifice that has been made for us is a complete sacrifice. It is a perfect sacrifice. Now that he goes, let's notice observation number four. The old Passover was a reminder of, the, of Israel's deliverance from Egyptian bondage. 
Exodus 12, 16 and 17. The new Passover is a reminder of our deliverance from sin and Satan. Hebrews 9, 22, uh, act, uh, Luke 22, and also in Acts 26. The exact day of the Passover was known, and the observance of this feast was co a constant reminder of this day, Exodus 12, 16 and 17. The, the exact day of the resurrection of our Lord is known, and the observance of the Lord's Supper is a constant reminder of that day. 1 Corinthians 11th chapter, verses 23 through 26, and Acts 27. Number six, the observance of the Jewish feast required physical strength. Deuteronomy 12, 26 through 28. Now, I want you to notice in this, concerning that, he said to observe and fear, uh, hear rather, observe and hear all the words which I command thee or commanded thee. Now, this is something it seems that we have overlooked. Now, back under the old law, God required them to accept whatever he had given them. They had no right to change it. They had no right to pass over it. And then he says, uh, in the next observation concerning the same matter, the observance of the Lord's Supper requires a spiritual uh, strength for each of us. We learn that we are to examine ourselves. We are to look into our own hearts. <clears throat> I'm not to look at uh, Brother Johnny Ramsey or somebody else and say, well, now he's not worthy of taking the Lord's Supper, or he's not doing it in a worthy manner. I'm to look into my own heart, into my own life, and to examine myself as an individual. And so I'm to commune with the Lord in observing the Lord's Supper. Number seven, it was imperative that they keep the Jewish Passover. <clears throat> that was required. They had to do that. They understood that. Exodus 12, verses 18 through 20, and Deuteronomy 17, or rather 12, 27. Then again, it is imperative that we keep the Lord's Supper. This is a requirement under the New Testament dispensation of time. Luke 22 and so on. And observation number eight. The Israelites were cut off if they failed to keep the feast of the Passover. Now, I want you to note that. Back under the old law, if they did not observe the feast of the Passover, they were cut off from Israel. They were cut off from God's people. Now then. We will be cut off and we will die a spiritual death if we fail to keep the Lord's Supper in the New Testament dispensation of time. 1 Corinthians 11th chapter, verses 26 through 30, Acts the 3rd chapter, verses 22 through 23. Now then, I'd like for us to notice some things concerning the purpose of the Lord's Supper. First of all, the Passover was in commemoration of the deliverance of the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. And as we observe the Lord's Supper, it is in remembrance of Christ. Uh, Christ who was taken in his youth while he was a young and vigorous man. And of course, uh, they took him. He was a perfect man. Not only from a physical standpoint was he outstanding, no doubt. But he was outstanding so far as his spiritual aspect. He was perfect. And yet he was taken and he was put to death. He was without blemish. He was without spot in any way so far as his spiritual aspects of life were concerned. Just as this animal back there <clears throat> was perfect so far as his physical makeup was concerned. They couldn't take a sick animal. They couldn't take an animal that was crippled. They couldn't take an animal that was afflicted in any way. And offer of that as a sacrifice under the law of Moses in remembrance of the deliverance of the children of Israel from Egyptian bondage. They had to take the very best. And there is none that equals our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. He was the very best. And these ingrates took him and they placed him upon the cross and they crucified him. As if to say that you're not fit for the earth and you're not fit for heaven. And suspended him between heaven and earth. As to say that he was a man without a country. They humiliated him in every way possible. They spat upon him. They mocked him. They made fun of him. And so on. All of these things were done to our Lord who was perfect. Who was without spot and without blemish. The one that made the supreme sacrifice for you and me. 
that we may have the opportunity of being here this very hour to study and to meditate upon that which our God has given us in the Bible. And then again, the Lord's Supper then is in remembrance of Christ. And we are to take the Lord's Supper to strengthen us as individuals from a spiritual standpoint. Now turn back to the book of Hebrews again. Now I want you to notice as I read from the 10th verse beginning of the 10th chapter. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now I might pause here just a moment. You remember back under the law that they had to make these sacrifices every year? This blood of these animals could not take away the sins of these people. And it had to be done every year. It was not a perfect uh, sacrifice. But now under the New Testament, Christ was perfect. This is a perfect sacrifice. It is a complete sacrifice. And therefore, when it was made once and for all, that was all that is necessary. Notice what he says as we continue our reading. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices and can never take away sins. But this man, after he had entered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfect he for by one offering he hath perfected for even them that are sanctified. By one offering, that's all that is necessary, that's complete. And that's the sacrifice that was made for you and for me. Now then, as we continue our reading, going down in the 25th verse of the same chapter, he says, Forsaking not the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much the more, uh, daily so much the more as we see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. We must understand that under the law of Moses, and he was writing to these Jews that understood that, he said here now then that the, uh, this uh, sacrifice, that, that sacrifice was made continually, year after year. But the Apostle Paul of the writer of the Hebrew letter says, he says, for if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. Jesus is not going to have to come and die for us again. His sacrifice is complete. It has been offered and it's been made once and for all time. And it's sufficient for us. And then again he goes on, he says, But a certain fearful looking for, a judge, for judgment, and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversary. Now notice this. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore, or how much greater punishment, suppose ye shall he be counted worthy who had trodden underfoot the Son of God and have counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing. Brethren, whatever the Bible teaches us to do so far as the communion is concerned, the Lord's Supper, we are duty bound to do it. Notice the blood uh, of these animals sealed or enjoined the Old Testament upon those people under the Old Testament law. The blood of our Lord and our Savior today enjoins or binds this law, this New Testament, upon those of us today who have been sanctified, who are in the Lord's church. That blood is uh, a seal, the New Testament, and there's no way that you and I can change it. Jesus said, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. The blood of the New Testament. Now then, this New Testament, whenever I fail to live up to it, when I fail to obey it, when I fail to follow the teachings of the New Testament, then I have counted the blood of the covenant wherewith I was sanctified an unholy thing. This is the precious blood of Jesus. This is the complete sacrifice. This is the ultimate. This is the greatest of all. There is no substitute. There is not anything that can improve upon what Jesus has already done for us. And therefore, we have to accept what the Bible teaches in regard to this, and we need to accept it by faith. So these are some of the things that we need to understand. Now then, when Jesus made the statement, he said, I am the bread of life. He said that, uh, uh, then he tells us in the book of John, the sixth chapter, that we are to eat 
uh, of him, and we are to drink of it. Now this does not, this is not confined to just the communion of the Lord's Supper in the sixth chapter of John. But this embraces all of the teachings of God's word. This embraces all of it, and Jesus often used metaphors to help us to understand from a spiritual standpoint the things uh, that, we, that relate to us as individuals in this life. Hence he said, I'm the bread of life. He did not mean that he was the literal bread. He said, I am the vine, and you're the branches, John 15. He did not mean that he was a literal vine, but he made that statement that we might understand the relationship that exists between us and Christ as we understand the relationship that exists between the vine and the branches. The branches could not survive cut loose from the vine. We cannot survive if we cut loose from Christ from a spiritual standpoint. It's just that plain and that simple. Then Jesus also, in talking to them, mentioned the fact that he was the bread of life, not the literal bread, but he said in the book of John, he said that, a man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So it's God's word. It's God's teaching, and so on. Then again, the elements of the Lord's Supper. We need to understand, first of all, that he took the bread, and he gave it to his disciples. He said, this is my body. He did not mean that it was his literal body, but he simply meant that what uh, his body is, that is the church, and so on, his body. What this bread was to his body, so we are to Christ. And as we eat that bread, we are partaking of our Lord. We are in uh, close communion with Christ. How closer can you get? How more intimate can you get than the very thing that Jesus was talking about here when he instituted the Lord's Supper? Then Paul, of course, brings out some things in the book of 1 Corinthians. I think it'd be well for us to notice that verify some of these things or just reiterate some of the things that Jesus has made a statement of to help the Corinthian brethren. Now he says, first of all, in verse 16 of the 10th chapter, he said, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? It's that communion, it's that intimacy it's that association, it's that fellowship that we have with Christ. It's that closeness that we have with Christ. And so he goes on to say, for we being many are one bread and one body. We are many, but we are one. And as we take of this one bread, we take of this one fruit of the vine. For we are partakers of, he says, that one bread. Then we go on into the 11th chapter. You notice some things. It would be well for us to read the 10th and 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians concerning the Lord's Supper. But he says here as we go down into the 23rd verse, he says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. This bread represents Christ. It represents his body, the one body. He only had one body. And his spiritual body is the Lord's church. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, Colossians 1, 18. That's the one body. That's the one church. And so when we are baptized into Christ, we are baptized into that one church. For we are God's children by faith, for as many of us, or as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Galatians, the third chapter, verses 26 and 27. So we are in Christ. We belong to him. We take of that one bread. It's a serious matter. It's a, something that we are to reverence. May I say this? You know, I can remember years ago. Many of you, brethren, can remember the same thing, you preacher, older preachers. We go out, we preach to these little country churches. Maybe there'd only be 25, 30, maybe 50 people in that congregation. They weren't able to support a preacher. Some of us who were working and trying to get started would go out and try to help them and preach to them. But you know, some Sundays they didn't even have a preacher. One of the members of the church who wasn't capable of preaching maybe could read the Bible. Get up and do some reading so far as verses are concerned. 
But you know there's one thing, even though they may not have had a preacher, they may not have had the best singing in the world. Some of them did have great singing, but some of them may not have had. But I'll tell you one thing, they knew how to partake of the Lord's Supper. And they knew what it was for. And the Lord's Supper, which is a communion of Christ, was that that held them together in spite of all of their difficulties and all of the things that come. And yet when I hear some of our brethren today that get up and criticize some of those fellows back there, it just tears me up. And I just can't hardly take it. Because I know, I've seen those things, and those brethren who were sincere, those brethren who loved the Lord, and it was all centered around the communion. They understood what it was for. And we need to understand what it's for. And I'd like to mention this at this point. We've got brethren today in the Lord's Church, as far as the communion is concerned, they're not satisfied with our coming together and taking the bread uh, as the Lord did when he instituted and as the first century Christians did. They want to come together and do that. But when the minute they start, and I had that experience, and boy, I tell you, it bothered me to no end. <coughs> Wife and I was traveling. We stopped the congregation. And just as soon as they started communion, they start singing. That's another thing. You know, somebody said, well, what's wrong with that? You know, that's the same argument that old Saul made when God sent him out to destroy all of the enemies and came back and finally made excuses why uh, the people wanted me to do it. Or we did it because we wanted to, 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 to help others and so forth. And this. That's not what God told them to do. They were a people that were a presumptuous people. They presumed something that God uh, had not authorized. Moses said, ask God to deliver him from such. The Old Testament, remember where the people were doing things of this nature, just assuming that things would be all right when God didn't authorize it. God made the statement to them. He said, well, because of your uh, presuming these things or this presumptuous sin, you're going to be cut off. God didn't spell out in so many words, say, don't you do this particular thing, but they took it on themselves to do it. You know, when we sing, that's one item. When we pray, that's another. And when we give and when we preach and teach, that's another. The Lord's Supper is something that is sacred, all of this. Now, you might have worship service, and you may not have a preacher in the audience. You may not have the best singing in the world. But I'll tell you what, everybody in the Lord's church can observe the Lord's Supper. You know, the Lord didn't tell us. By the way, I want to mention one other thing before I forget it. You know, somebody said, well, isn't singing an item of worship? Yes, it is. You know, I think about it like water and salt. You know, both are good. They're good in their place. But when you mix them, water will not quench. Salt water will not quench a person's thirst. There's no way. And, you know, you've heard the saying, water, water everywhere, not a drop to drink. It's out in the ocean, and there you have the salt water and, and no fresh water to drink. And uh, people have died because they couldn't get fresh water. Now, salt is good for certain things. Nothing thing wrong with salt as long as it's used in its place for the purpose it was intended to be used for. It preserved meat back in those days. It preserved a lot of things. And so on. it was necessary back in those days. I can remember even when I was a boy, we didn't have refrigeration, things of this nature, as we have it today. And we'd put uh, meat. The stores, for example, would have uh, what they call meat boxes. Some of you may remember that. They'd have salt and then have their meat in there. And the salt was there to preserve the meat, keep it good in that place, certainly. It was an essential. But put it in water, it wasn't. It was detrimental. And so it is with the Lord. So we need to keep it pure. We need to keep everything in the proper perspective. And so that's one thing I think we need to think about when we want to improve upon what the Lord has already designated. Very simple and plain. So let's not get out of that. Then again, I want us to notice too, as we go on, I want to read just a little bit more here. He says here in this verse, he says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was uh, betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. We are to do this in remembrance of Christ. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take eat, this is my body. And so on. And after the same manner also he took the cup. Uh, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament of my blood. You cannot separate this from the New Testament. 
Jesus said he died for it. Jesus said, this is my blood of the New Testament. And now he says, after the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. We're to remember Jesus. For as oft as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. We show the Lord's death until he come. This is the purpose of it. Then again, I'd like to also mention the fact that as off as we take the Lord's Supper does not mean Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and Saturday. The Lord designated the day that we are to observe the Lord's Supper, which is the first day of the week. It wasn't on Friday, it wasn't on Monday, Tuesday, Saturday, but the day. Jesus was raised from the dead the first day. And we find at every time, so far as I know, that he met with his disciples after his resurrection was on the first day of the week. And then we find that in the, in the second chapter of the book of Acts, the Lord's church was set up, established, that they began observing the Lord's Supper in remembrance of the resurrection of our Lord. That was the first day of the week. And then we go on in Acts 20 and verse 7, they met upon the first day of the week to break bread. That was the first day of the week. And who am I to be presumptuous and to say that this is not good enough for us and that we can improve upon that, we can make it more solemn and what have you. Don't you believe it? There's not any way that we can improve upon what God has already done. In his infinite wisdom, he set it up like he has set it up in order for you and I to observe it. He knows and he knew and he knows what's best for you and me. We may not know what's best for us, but God does. And then another point we are told that we are to speak with the same mind and the same mouth. Now, whenever we do not do this, according to the statement of the Apostle Paul in the Roman letter, when we do not do this, we're speaking out of one corner of the mouth and one thing, and the other corner is something else, and we're speaking to them. We're to speak with one mind and one mouth. Then again, he says, let there be no divisions among you, but that you be of the same mind and of the same judgment. We are to be of one mind, brethren. And the only way that you and I are going to be of one mind is by doing exactly what this book has said. Jesus has gone into heaven. When he died, he shed his blood. He went into heaven as a high priest to make atonement for the sins of every individual. That's where he went. That's where he went before the place. Just like the high priest went into the most holy place. Jesus has gone into the most holy place. He's gone into heaven. He has made the supreme sacrifice. And let me call your attention to one other thing. The uh, psalmist David made this statement, and we need to learn this lesson. He said, forever, O Lord, is thy word settled in heaven. Uh, you can't settle it, and I can't settle it. It's already settled. And they settled in heaven. Now, as we bring our lesson to a close, I just want to make mention here uh, one other point, and that is, as we think about serving the Lord, I want to read to you from Colossians, the third chapter. He said, if you then be risen with Christ. Now, those of us who are Christians have been risen with Christ. Now, listen to this. Seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. That's what I'm to look to. Then he says, set your mind or your affection on things above, not on the things of this world. Let's don't become worldly and try to change God's teaching, God's law to suit our own fancies and to be, uh, make it ritualistic or whatever you want to call it, and, and so on, contrary to God's will. Set your affections on things above, not on the things of the earth, for ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Is your life hid with Christ in God? Are you content to follow Christ? Are you content to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth in observing the Lord's Supper? Do you know beyond any shadow of a doubt what you're doing is right? Now, you can't go wrong when you follow this. And our souls are too precious, and we're taking too great a risk when we deviate from what the Bible teaches. For you're dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. The bottom line, brethren, is to go to heaven. 
I want to pray. I want to impress God. Number one, that's the first thing. And if I impress my brethren while I'm doing it, that's great. I'm happy. But I'm not going to make a decision to please bre my brethren instead of pleasing my God. I want God to know that I'm doing what's right to the best of my ability. Now, in conclusion, as we close, Paul said to the elders of the church in Acts the 20th chapter, verse 32, when he had met with them, talked to them, and told them to take heed unto themselves the flock over which the Holy Spirit hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he had purchased with his own blood. And verse 32, he says, And now, brethren, I commend you unto God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among them who are sanctified.